Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now, here is Pastor Dennis Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this Family Bible Study Hour. Ready to get back into our Father's Word here at the chapel. We invite you to get your Bible and join us if you care to. We're going to pick it up today, 2 Samuel chapter 13, verse 21. And we're a little over halfway through David's 40-year reign. David's getting on up in years. He has, excuse me, he has children who are uh, sexually active, which we witnessed in our last lesson, in that his oldest son, Amnon, raped his daughter, uh, Amnon's half-sister, Tamar. Uh, Maaka was the mother of Tamar and Absalom. Uh, Amnon was not uh, Maaka's son, but was David's son. So, uh, and of course, there's two things wrong with what Amnon did. One, he raped a woman. Second, it was an incestuous affair, uh, his sister. Uh, so both of those uh, are worthy of death. And we're going to see Absalom, and you, and you may recall in our last lesson, Absalom told Tamar, put it out of your head. I don't want you thinking about taking revenge against Amnon. I will take care of it. And that's what we're going to see in our lesson today. Absalom uh, bringing uh, justice, if you will. David's not going to look at it as justice. David uh, is going to look at it as murder, uh, which he's looking at it wrong. And he'll learn in chapter 14 that he is looking at it wrong. So let's ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name, Father. We ask you to open eyes, open ears this day. 2 Samuel chapter 13, verse 21, and it reads, <clears throat> But when King David heard of all these things, he was very wroth. And what David heard was that Amnon had raped uh, Tamar, his daughter. And he got angry, but that's all he did. Uh, you know, David, uh, being the king, is also the judge of Israel. He's responsible for making sure that justice is done in the land of Israel. Uh, getting angry over someone raping their sister is not making sure that justice is being done. This is just another example of what the prophet Nathan told David in chapter 12 uh, after he had Uriah the Hittite uh, killed basically by the Ammonites. God looked at that as though David had killed Uriah the Hittite, and he said, the sword will never pass from your house, your immediate family, and uh, violence becoming more the, the norm in David's house than the exception. David wasn't able to discipline himself. He wasn't able to discipline his children either. Verse 22, And Absalom spake unto his brother Amnon, neither good nor bad, I mean not a word, not so much as a peep. For Absalom hated Amnon because he had forced his sister Tamar. He raped her and then threw her out. And you may recall in our last lesson, Tamar looked on the latter, the fact that he threw her out after he forced her uh, is worse than, if, than, than him forcing her, than raping her. Throwing her out was worse situation for Tamar. It was like uh, he was divorcing uh, her. And then that's putting the shame back on Tamar. That had everyone talking, well, what did Tamar do to Amnon that he threw her out? Uh, putting the suspicion back on Tamar the shame on Tamar rather than where it belonged, which was on Amnon. 23, and it came to pass after two full years. I'll tell you one thing, Absalom is patient if he is nothing else. 
that Absalom had sheep shears in Baal Hazor, which is beside Ephraim. And Absalom invited all the king's sons, including Amnon. Now, the sheep shearing time, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, ancient biblical times in the Old Testament, was party time. I mean, they broke out the wine flasks. Uh, it was a, a feast. They had uh, plenty to eat. It, it was like a festival atmosphere at sheep shearing time. You might remember uh, one of the 12 patriarchs, Judah, uh, his favorite time of the year was sheep shearing time. Uh, and it's ironic that I brought him up because his daughter-in-law, Tamar, by the same name of Absalom's sister, uh, uh, got him drunk and took some of his seed from him. Verse 24. And it's probably a good thing she did. If not, uh, he would have uh, polluted his seed with Gentiles. Verse 24. And Absalom came to the king, to David, and said, Behold now, thy servant hath sheep shears. Let the king, I beseech thee, and his servants go with thy servant. C come to the party, dad. It's, it's going to be, we're going to have a good time. The wine's going to be flowing. Uh, the food is going to be plenteous. Uh, come and enjoy with us. And the king said to Absalom, Nay, my son, let us not all now go, lest we be chargeable unto thee. And he pressed him. Absalom pressed David even the more. Howbeit he would not go, but blessed him. In other words, no, son, you go ahead and, and have a, a, a good time. What this uh, it, not chargeable unto you means that uh, David's saying your place is not big enough for all of us. We, we don't want to be a burden to you because the, the, that everyone went knowing that your place just is not that large. Verse 26, then said Absalom, if not, in other words, if you won't go, David, I pray thee, let my brother Amnon go with us. And the king said unto him, Why should he go with thee? I think David, uh, we, we learned in verse 21, David knew what Amnon had done to Tamar. I think he's becoming a little bit suspicious about Absalom's intentions. Uh, then again, though, he might be saying, well, it's been two years and nothing has happened, so uh, perhaps uh, everything is well uh, with Absalom. Not everything is well with Absalom and things are getting ready to get a whole lot worse for Amnon. But Absalom pressed him, David, that he let Amnon and all the king's sons go with him. Verse 28, Now Absalom had commanded his servant, saying, Mark ye now when Amnon's heart is merry with wine. When he starts uh, giggling and, and speaking a little bit giddy. And when I say unto you, Smite Amnon, then kill him. Fear not, have not I commanded you, be courageous and be valiant. Now, Amnon is the king's son, and he's assuring, though, his servants that he'll take responsibility for the death of Amnon. Do it, and do it right. And, and you know, Amnon, or excuse me, Absalom is not out of his rights legally according to God's word. What Amnon did was worthy of death. And that's what he is making sure happens. It should have happened two years earlier when he raped in, in Tamar, uh, his sister. That's two capital offenses, incest and also rape. Uh, Amnon's guilty. Absalom is carrying out the sentence according to God's word. Verse 29, And the servants of Absalom did unto Amnon as Absalom had commanded. Then all the king's sons arose, and every man gat him, this in the Hebrew is rode, upon his mule and fled. All the king's sons heard, or maybe even some of them witnessed, 
Ab Amnon being killed. Uh, many of them probably thought, we better get out of here. Absalom is planning on killing all the king's sons so that he will be the heir to the throne. No brothers, no competition when it's time to fill the role. Verse 30, And it came to pass, while they were in the way, that tidings came to David, saying, Absalom hath slain all the king's sons, and there is not one of them left. Now this is not true. Uh, Absalom only killed or had killed his brother Amnon and that for a justifiable reason. He raped uh, his sister Tamar. This is a good example though is what happens when the old grapevine gets cranked up and once one person tells of an event and then another person adds a little bit to it and retells it, and then who they, who they tell it to adds a little bit to it, and before you know it, uh, the, the event is exaggerated completely out of proportion. That's what happened here. Uh, Absalom did not kill all of David's sons, but that's the word that ended up uh, getting to David. Verse 31. Then the king arose and tear his garments. He thinks that all of his sons are dead and lay on the earth and all his servants stood by with their clothes rent, mourning uh, what they think is the death of all of the king's sons. Now this would be very serious. Uh, you see, uh, David is the king of the most powerful nation in the world. If all of his sons were dead, uh, that leaves no one to inherit uh, the kingdom of Israel. Verse 32, And Jonadab, the son of Shimei, called Shema in other places, David's brother, answered and said, Let not my Lord suppose that they have slain all the young men, the king's sons. <clears throat> For Amnon only is dead. For by the appointment, this is by the mouth in the Hebrew, of Absalom, this hath been determined. From a day that he for from the day he forced his sister Tamar. You know, this is a bit ironic because it was Jonadab's idea to begin with that Amnon uh, pretend that he was sick, so that when David came and witnessed that he was in bed and sick that he could say, oh, have my sister Tamar come and prepare breakfast for me and have her feed me in bed and I'll be feeling better, which unbeknownst to David set up the uh, possibility or the, the uh, location where Tamar would be raped by her brother Amnon. So it was Jonadab's idea of how to bring that to pass. You're not going to hear Jonadab telling David that, oh, by the way, that was my idea. Now, Jonadab being the son of David's brother, that makes him a first cousin to Amnon, Absalom, uh, also a nephew to David. Verse 33, Now therefore let not my lord the king take the thing to his heart, to think that all the king's sons are dead, for Amnon only is dead. Uh, Jonadab making points with his uncle David. Again, you don't hear him saying, making any claims to the fact that it was he who gave Amnon the idea of how to set the situation up where he could rape Tamar. Verse 34, But Absalom fled, and the young man that kept the watch lifted up his eyes and looked. This is the young man who kept the watch in Jerusalem where David is. And behold, there came much people by the way of the hillside behind him, all the king's sons, minus uh, Amnon and minus Absalom, all returning home with the exception of those two. And Jonadab said unto the king, Behold, the king's sons come. As thy servant said, so it is. It's just as I told you, Uncle David, 
uh, not all of your sons are dead, just Amnon. And it came to pass, as soon as he had made an end of speaking, that, behold, the king's sons came and lifted up their voice and wept. And the king also and all his servants wept very sore. A very great weeping is what this is in the Hebrew, what very sore means. And what they're doing is grieving uh, Amnon's death. Uh, but again, Absalom had the right to carry out that punishment by God's law. Uh, Amnon was worthy of death. David is not looking upon it that way. 37. But Absalom fled and went to Talmai, the son of Amihud, uh, king of Geshur. And David mourned for his son every day. He mourned for his son Amnon, not for his son Absalom. Now, Talmai, uh, we learned in chapter 3, verse 3 of this same book, is the grandfather of Absalom <coughs> on his mother's side. In other words, Talmai is Maaka's father. He's running for protection to his grandparents. He knows that David thinks what he did is murder, and he is fearing what the uh, restitution would be from King David uh, for what happened to Amnon. 38, so Absalom fled and went to Geshur and was there three years, afraid to return to Jerusalem for what David uh, might do to him. And the soul of the king David longed to go forth unto Absalom, for he was comforted concerning Amnon, seeing he was dead. Now, this verse is interpreted many different ways uh, by the scholars. Uh, some believe that David, uh, because time passed, uh, that uh, the loss of his son Amnon uh, had grown to where it was not uh, so hurting to David, and therefore uh, he wanted to go forth unto Absalom. This word unto can be translated against, and I lean toward the scholars who believe that David uh, was uh, wanted to, he longed to go forth against Absalom to revenge or avenge the death of Amnon. And that's further supported by what happens in chapter 14. Uh, chapter 14, we see uh, Joab is going to go to great lengths to make up a f fictitious, uh, fictional story made up by and with the assistance of an actress to make David realize what Absalom did was justified. And he's going to go to great lengths to do that. As a result, Absalom uh, will return to Jerusalem, but there's a two-year period after he was gone three years to Gezer. Uh, David refused to see him for two years after he returned to Jerusalem. Uh, that's another indication to me that David did not long to go forth unto Absalom. He wanted to go against Absalom. Chapter 14, verse 1. Now Joab, the son of Zariah, perceived that the king's heart was toward Absalom. This word toward, again, can be translated against it's the Hebrew word al, A-L, transliterated, and it can be translated against. If David had forgiven Absalom, there would be no need for Joab to go to the great lengths that he goes through uh, making up this hypothetical situation and employing a, an actress to convince David. David wouldn't have refused to see Absalom for two years after his return if he's, his heart was toward Absalom. His heart was against Absalom. Verse 2, And Joab sent to Tekoa, uh, Tekoa uh, being the home of Amos, 
the minor prophet, just as a side note, and fetch thence a wise woman, and said unto her, I pray thee, feign thyself to be a mourner. I want you to act like you are in mourning, and put on now mourning apparel, and anoint not thyself with oil, but be as a woman that had a long time mourned for the dead. Um, David is not the only one with things to hide. Uh, Joab murdered uh, uh, Abner, the general of Saul. He would later murder Amasa as well. Now, I think what uh, Absalom or Joab is trying to do here is he believes that Absalom will one day inherit the throne. And he's thinking that if word gets back to Absalom that I helped change David's mind to where Absalom could return to Jerusalem, that when Absalom becomes the king, uh, the fact that I murdered uh, Abner and Amasa uh, won't be brought up in the future. Good plan, but it doesn't work out. Verse 3. And come to the king, Joab uh, continues with instructions to the woman from Tekoa. And come to the king, to David, and speak on this manner unto him. So Joab put the words in her mouth. He told her exactly what she should say. And uh, Joab is setting up, uh, along with the help of this woman, is setting up a, a trap for David. And when the woman of Tekoa spake to the king, she fell on her face to the ground and did obeyance and said, Help, O king. This word help in the Hebrew, a word many of you are familiar with in the Hebrew, Hosanna, which means save now. Save me, King David, is what she's saying. And she's playing her cards right to fall in obeyance to the king. And the king said unto her, What aileth thee? What, what's your problem, woman? And she answered, I am indeed a widow a woman, and mine husband is dead. There's a sad song coming up. And what we have here is a pretty good actress. She would be a star on any, most any soap opera uh, that we have on television today. A widow woman, by the way, depends on her sons. Uh, her husband obviously is no longer able to provide uh, her needs, uh, and therefore she, that responsibility would fall on her sons. And thy handmaid had two sons, and they two strove together in the field. They were fighting against each other. And there was none to part them, but the one smote the other and slew him. We see what Joab is up to. His intention is to have David pass judgment in favor of this woman uh, and forgiving the son who slew his brother, knowing that it wasn't premeditated murder. Uh, the boys were fighting and it got out of hand. And many people think that anytime someone's killed, that God's word says that the penalty is the death penalty. That's not the case at all. Uh, in the case of accidents, uh, in the case that this hypothetical situation is, would be manslaughter. Uh, the, the fighting got out of hand. It wasn't the one brother didn't intend and premeditate to kill his brother. It just got out of hand, and, and things happen like this. Verse 7, And behold, the whole family is risen against thine handmaid. And they said, Deliver him that smote his brother, that we may kill him for the life of his brother whom he slew. And we will destroy the heir also, the only remaining heir. And so they shall quench my coal which is left. There'll be nothing for me to build a fire with, is what this is saying. And shall not leave to my husband neither name 
nor remainder upon the earth. They're going to cut off my husband's seed completely by killing uh, the son who slew his brother. And the king said unto the woman, Go to thine house, and I will give charge concerning thee. Uh, David just passed judgment. He's decided that the son should not be killed because it was not premeditated murder. What this I will give charge is, he's saying, I've passed judgment and I will give the necessary commands uh, that your son be not slain. David doesn't realize it yet, but he is the family who is seeking blood revenge in this scenario, hypothetical situation. Verse 9, And the woman of Tekoa said unto the king, My lord, O king, the iniquity be on me and on my father's house, and the king and his throne be guiltless. What she's saying here is, King, if you have made the wrong judgment, let the guilt and the iniquity be on my house and my father's house, not upon the king and his house. Verse 10, And the king said, Whosoever saith aught unto thee, bring him to me, and he shall not touch thee any more. You, if you have any problems with this, you bring the one who offends you to me, and I'll make sure it does not happen again. David has been set up by Joab and this actress. Verse 11, Then said she, I pray thee, let the king remember the Lord thy God, that thou wouldest not suffer the revengers of blood to destroy any more lest they destroy my son. Here she's asking David to take an oath uh, that he will not allow her other son to be destroyed. Kind of pushy. And he said, As the Lord liveth, there's your oath, uh, there shall not one hair of thy son fall to the earth. This applies to Absalom as well. And uh, Absalom has a lot of hair as we'll see uh, in our next lecture, verse 12. Then the woman said, Let thine handmaid, I pray thee, speak one word more, uh, or I added the word more, unto my lord the king. And he said, Say on. Now, anyone who has ever worked in sales knows that when you have the sale made, close and get out of there. That's what you do as a salesperson because a lot of times uh, an inexperienced salesperson will keep talking and before you know it, they've talked the person that they made the sale to out of making the purchase. So uh, a good salesman or sales lady, woman, when the, you know that the sale is made, close and get out of there. Uh, she's not closing and getting out of there. Remember, Joab put all these words in her mouth. Uh, she's not going to spare one of them. She's going to say everything that Joab told her, instructed her to say. And the woman said, Wherefore then hast thou thought such a thing? Uh, not forgiving Absalom, in other words, against the people of God. For the king doth speak this thing as one which is faulty in that the king doth not fetch home again his banished. You made it to where my son would not be punished, but you're punishing your own son, Absalom. Now, you see, this woman's pretty sharp. Uh, Joab probably thinks he's pretty sharp as well. But let me assure you, King David uh, was not a fool. He was not stupid. And this woman is going to say enough that King David is going to perceive that he's been tricked. Um, you said, my son should not die, yet you won't forgive your own son, Absalom. For we must needs die, and are as water spilt on the ground, which cannot be gathered up again. These are both figures of speech that, that mean life is short. 
Neither doth God respect any person. God doesn't show any favoritism or, or partiality. Yet doth he devise means that his banished be not expelled from him. David beginning to realize that he has been had. Uh, God forgives uh, everyone. Why don't you forgive David is what the woman of Tekoa is saying. 15. Now therefore that I am come to speak of this thing unto my lord the king, it is because the people have made me afraid. And thy handmaid said, I will now speak unto the king. It may be that the king will perform the request of his handmaid. Here she returns to the subject of her uh, situation. The one son uh, got in a fight with the other and killed the brother and the other family members pushing her uh, to turn him over that, that justice can be rendered. Here she's covering the allusion to that David and his, uh, for his treatment of Absalom. And I think she realized that and sensed that David was getting close to figuring out what Joab and her had up their sleeve. Verse 16, for the king will hear to deliver his handmaid out of the hand of the man that would destroy me and my son together out of the inheritance of Israel. Again, David wising up what's going on and he realizes that uh, uh, his decision to spare the one son also should apply to Absalom. Uh, he's not going to be happy with Joab or this woman. Verse 17, Then thine handmaid said, The word of my lord the king shall now be comfortable, or will give rest to me. For as an angel of God, so is my lord the king, to discern good and bad. Therefore the Lord thy God will be with thee. Now she's pouring it on a little thick, wouldn't you say? Verse 18, Then the king answered and said unto the woman, Hide not from me, I pray thee, the thing that I shall ask thee. I imagine the woman of Tekoa is getting a little nervous about this time. And the woman said, Let my lord the king now speak. It would be a very dangerous thing to lie to the king of Israel. And David's insisting that she answer this question truthfully. And the king said, Is not the hand of Joab with thee in all this? Bingo! And the woman answered and said, As thy soul liveth, my lord the king, none can turn to the right hand or to the left from aught that my lord the king hath spoken. You are right on target, David. For thy servant Joab, he bade me and put all these words in the mouth of thine handmaid. I mean, the woman of Tekoa rolled over on Joab she threw him under the bus. Um, she sold Joab out faster than you can say, uh, I'm, a non, I'm a paid uh, non-attorney spokesperson. Uh, the, that's the phrase they say on these lawsuit commercials where attorneys are trying to get you to use their service to make a claim. But anyway, we'll come back in our next lecture and see how all this turns out. Uh, this woman, though, she was quite an actress, uh, but David figured it out and he insisted that she tell the truth. Uh, she threw Joab under the bus. What's Joab going to uh, receive from David? Well, uh, David never did quite forgive Joab for killing Abner. In fact is, David, on, almost on his deathbed, one of the last instructions he gave his son Solomon was, see to it that Joab does not go down to his grave with a gray head. You use your wisdom to figure out a way to take Joab out, and Solomon did that. We'll come back in our next lecture and see how this turns out. We've got a short message. We'll ask you to listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? 
Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Welcome back. We're glad you could join back with us. Let's have the 800 number, please. 800-643-4645. That number good throughout Puerto Rico, the U.S., and Canada. If you have a biblical question that you'd like to pose to be answered on the air, uh, feel free to call that number and leave your question. Uh, please don't ask questions about a specific individual denomination or organization. Uh, we try to teach God's Word in a positive manner. Throwing out negative about others serves no purpose. We simply won't do it. We'll let God's Word do the teaching, correcting, and healing, fully capable of all three. If you're studying via the Internet somewhere around the world and unable to use that 800 number, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Quite all right to mail your questions in being the point. Got a prayer request? Well, you don't need a telephone number. You don't need a mailing address. What you need to do is talk to your Heavenly Father. Uh, you do that through prayer. Uh, go to Him at least once a day. Make some time, a set time of the day that you can talk to your Father. It, it pleases Him when you do that. Uh, and don't let it be the only time that He hears from you is when you got trouble, uh, when you need something from Him. Uh, he loves his children to tell him that they love him, if you really do. So we do have these prayer requests, Father. We come united as one in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we ask you to look upon these. You know their needs, Father. Uh, illness in families, Father. We ask for a healing if it is your will. We also lift up our military troops who are in harm's way around the world. Father, watch over, guide, direct, touch, heal. In Jesus' precious name. Amen and thank you, Father. Let's get to some questions. See what's on the mind of folks around the country. First up today, we have Thomas in Michigan. Where is it in the Bible that the Antichrist comes first? Well, many, many places. Uh, Second Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 4 uh, make it very clear that before uh, what Paul starts off in saying in verse 1 of chapter 2 is, uh, I want you to, to, to know that the Lord is not going to return. Jesus is not going to return at the second advent until at, at, until at first a uh, falling away, which is apostasy, uh, takes place, and that man of sin be revealed. That's uh, Satan in his role as Antichrist. And uh, it goes on to say in verse 4 that he's going to uh, exalt himself above all that is worshipped, all that is God, so that he, as God, sitting in the temple, uh, makes it out himself out to be as he is God. Uh, that's his goal. Isaiah chapter 14 is a second witness to that, where he is Lucifer, sets up his throne on the north side and he wants God's children to worship him. This is anonymous. I usually don't take anonymous questions. Uh, I'm a felon, and it is a struggle in the world to do anything. What does God do about people like me? He says, repent, uh, be forgiven, and live. And I'm not talking about living in the flesh. I'm talking about living eternally. Uh, that's what your heavenly Father. So 2 Peter chapter 3, uh, verse 9, it states there that God is long-suffering. That means that He's patient, not willing that any of His children should perish, 
but all should come to repentance. That's what God's will is. Is, uh, is that going to happen? No, unfortunately, there are going to be some who go in the lake of fire. That's the second death, the death of the soul. But that's what he wants. He wants all of his children to repent and live. Erdy in North Carolina. I watch Shepherd's Chapel every morning. Uh, can you tell me why I think of my past all the time? I pray a lot and when I lay down, here comes all my past and my thoughts. I'm trying to live for God now. That should all be on my mind now. I'm almost 80 years old. I think of all the things that I did. Please help one also pray for me. Thank you. And you are in our prayers. But uh, it's highly likely, Erdy, that you haven't forgiven yourself. God's forgiven you, but you haven't forgiven yourself. Christians oftentimes like to beat themselves up over and over and over. Uh, they think, well, you know, I, I'm too good of a person that I shouldn't have let that happen. And I just can't believe that I did something so terrible. Well, it's not possible that anyone has committed the unforgivable sin at this point in time. So my recommendation, Erdy, would be to for, learn to forgive yourself. I'm sure that you being a Christian, you've, you've repented and you've asked for God's forgiveness. But to continue to beat yourself up it's like doubting that God has the ability to forgive. Um, Pastor Arnold Murray did a message many moons ago called Forgiveness, and it's CD 30425. And he spends quite a bit of time on learning to forgive yourself when you have been forgiven by God. You might want to order that. Ernie in South Carolina. Where in the Bible does it say a preacher should not preach for his own profit. Well, in Matthew uh, chapter 6, verse 24, it states there the words of Jesus, you cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon is another word for uh, wealth. Uh, but on, on the other hand, Luke chapter 10, verse 7, uh, Jesus is instructing the 10 disciples who are about to be promoted to apostles uh, which means one who is sent forth, but he's preparing them to teach the Word of God. And he states there in Luke chapter 10, verse 7, that a servant is worth his hire. So when you say someone should preach for his own profit, uh, a servant is worth his hire. That doesn't mean, though, that pay or money should be the motivating factor when someone preaches. Um, if all someone preaches about is money or saying that if you don't send a uh, contribution, we're probably going to be off the air next Sunday, uh, you can tell where their heart is. It's with the mammon, the wealth. Uh, you don't hear us here at Shepherd's Chapel uh, browbeating people to send money. We teach God's Word chapter by chapter, verse by verse, uh, we know that people are intelligent enough to know when they're, they're listening to a, an anointed uh, ministry and they will support that ministry. We're, we're a prime example of that. We don't have to beg to have time uh, across the nation. Uh, God has given us a very large format, uh, a very large platform on which to, re to preach God's Word to the world. We thank him for that platform. Willa in Pennsylvania. It says in Joshua chapter 11, verse 20, For it was of the Lord to harden their hearts that they should come against Israel in battle, that he might destroy them utterly, and etc. My question, why in so many places does God harden people's hearts to do bad and turn against him? Does everything go back to the first earth age? Thank you and all your staff for giving uh, us God's word and doing a wonderful job. It has.
to be very hard. My prayers are with you and your staff. Well, we thank you and we appreciate your prayers. You're in our prayers as well. Um, these people that you're talking about in Joshua chapter 11, verse 20, were Can excuse me, Canaanites. That's Canaanites with the C. Uh, they were a heathen uh, people who occupied the promised land. God instructed Israel to wipe them out. Uh, why? Well, Deuteronomy uh, chapter 7, verses 1 through 5, God makes it very clear. If you don't wipe them out, before you know it, you'll be taking their daughters to your sons to wife. You'll be giving your daughters to their sons to wife. And before you know it, you'll be worshiping their gods. And you know what? God was right. Uh, they didn't annihilate the Canaanites, and on many occasions, Israel was guilty of worshiping uh, the gods, that small g, of the Canaanites. It came to pass. Edith in Michigan. <clears throat> Thank you for teaching the word. You're welcome. It's a labor of love. I would like to know if the shadow government is mentioned in the Bible. I am hearing this mentioned a lot. Uh, can you explain what a shadow government is and if it's something that we should know about? Well, a shadow government uh, is a supposed conspiracy, I guess would be a good word, where elected government official, officials really aren't in charge. Um, a shadow governments are controlled uh, by private individuals exercising power behind the scenes. Uh, and if you want to know if a shadow government is biblical, stay tuned for 2 Samuel uh, chapter 15, for we're going to see a real good example of a shadow government which is controlled by Absalom behind the scenes. Rudy in North Carolina, if a man takes another person's life, then this man gets saved, will he go to heaven? Well, that depends on how he took the life. Uh, as I said in our lesson today, it seems that many people think that if someone is killed, that the person who killed them, it's mandatory capital punishment. That's not the case at all in God's law. There are instances where accidents happen uh, the, in Deuteronomy, the example given is that the, uh, an axe head fly off the handle and strikes someone uh, and kills them. That's an accident. You, you're not going to hold the person who that happened to responsible for premeditated murder. Now, uh, for premeditated murder, <clears throat> it states in John, the first epistle, of John chapter 3 verse 15 that a murderer cannot find salvation in the flesh. Well, why is that? Well, because God's law says a murderer, someone who does lie in wait premeditated murder, they're to be killed and sent to Father. And then that's where the trial is held. God is there, the murderer is there, and the person who was murdered is there as well. Now, is that saying that that person cannot be forgiven? No, I didn't say that. What I said was God's Word, first epistle of John, chapter 3, verse 15, states that a, a murderer cannot find salvation in the flesh. Can they find salvation after they leave the flesh? That's totally up to God. He's the judge. Leroy in Virginia how do I know if I am one of God's elect to speak against the Antichrist? And how will I know when the Holy Spirit is trying to speak through me? Well, if you know God's overall plan and you know that the Antichrist comes first, uh, you're likely one of God's elect. Now, the, when the Holy Spirit won't try to speak through God's elect, he will speak through God's elect. So uh, don't premeditate what you're going to say. It will be given to you in that very hour by the Holy Spirit. You follow with another question. In the Lord's day, the millennium, if I make it in the first resurrection, 
will I be able to go and help my brother who has never been married but has seven children from three different women? Well, the answer is yes. The only restriction on family that you can't go to is a sister who is married. And why would that prohibition be? Well, in, when a woman marries, she's no longer a, a member of the family she was born into. She becomes a member of the family that she marries into. Ezekiel 44, 25 is where uh, I'm, the scripture I'm pulling from. <clears throat> Jay from Ohio. Will the elect recognize Antichrist when he arrives? And is the unpardonable sin a rejection of the Holy Spirit and to sign up with the devil? Yes, we will uh, recognize the Antichrist. Um, first thing we'll to have coming to us before the Antichrist arrives are the two witnesses. And the elect will, being fed, will be being fed uh, by the two golden, the two candlesticks of God. Zechariah chapter 14 is what I'm speaking of. Uh, oil is symbolic of truth and the two witnesses will be pumping oil to God's elect. And of course blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is not forgivable. You mentioned the unpardonable sin. Luke chapter 12 verses 10 through 13. That's for one of God's elect to refuse the Holy Spirit to speak through them. <clears throat> Dan in Virginia, please explain about when Michael the archangel is let go on earth before Satan. I don't know where you're getting that from, Dan. Michael and his angels fight against Satan and his angels in heaven, not on earth. Uh, Revelation chapter 12, verse 6 and the following verses. And uh, Michael and his angels prevail uh, and then they cast Satan and his angels out onto earth and it's woe unto you on earth. Revelation chapter 12, verse 6 and the following verses. Joanne in Wisconsin, I hope you can answer this question. I hope I can too. I'm aged and have had more time to read the Bible. I know that having repentance and a belief in the fact that Jesus did, oh, died, excuse me, for our sins is necessary for forgiveness. But is it necessary to be baptized? Uh, Jesus telling Nicodemus, unless a person is born again by water, he cannot have eternal life. For I know that those who believe but who are not baptized. Thank you and God bless. And God bless you as well, Joanne. Uh, John chapter 3 verse 5 also states that you have to be born of water to enter the kingdom of God. Many people incorrectly teach that that means you must be baptized. That's not what it means at all. What it means is that you have to be born in the flesh. What's the first thing that happens before a child is born? Uh, the, the mother's water breaks, and that's what to be born of water means, as opposed to the fallen angels who refuse to be born of woman and they are reserved in chains of darkness uh, unto judgment. Uh, Jude chapter 1 verse 6. <clears throat> Jerry from Georgia, <clears throat> excuse me, I have learned a lot from Shepherd's Chapel in the last four or five years. I'm glad you're enjoying studying the Word. Question, according to Genesis chapter 4 verse 1, it states that Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man-child from the Lord. How can Satan be Cain's father? Well, because Eve had already conceived before Adam knew her. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, God is dressing down the serpent and Eve for what they did in the Garden of Eden. He tells, God tells Eve, I'm going to greatly multiply thy conception. Do you know what that means? That means that she had conceived. You see, 
Cain, and, and there in, in Genesis chapter 4, verse 2, it goes on to say that Eve again bare Abel. Check out that word again. It means she continued. So tell me, what happens, what has happened if a woman gives birth to a child and she continues in labor and gives birth to another child? And she's just had twins. But you see, Adam, excuse me, Cain and Abel were of the same mother, but not the same father. And if you don't believe that's biologically possible, talk to your family doctor. He'll tell you that that is possible. They were, uh, Cain was fathered by the serpent. Uh, Abel was fathered by Adam. You see, you won't find Cain in Adam's genealogy in Genesis chapter 5. Why? He wasn't his son. Timothy in Maine. How can the church tell when the real two witnesses show up? Can you tell if they, how can we tell if they are false? Well, I can appreciate your saying the real two witnesses because believe it or not, we've had, I think the last count was over a thousand uh, people that have showed up here at Shepherd's Chapel claiming to be one of the two witnesses. But yes, the, most of the church won't know the two witnesses. They're going to be deceived by the Antichrist. God's elect will know the two witnesses. I'm out of time. I want you to know that I love you a great deal because you enjoy studying God's Word in depth. You know what? When God looks down from heaven and He sees you reading the letter He wrote to you, the Bible, it makes His day. You make His day, He's going to make yours. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others who are lost in this world of darkness. One thing most important though, and it's this, you stay in His Word every day. Every day in your Father's Word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? It's because Jesus is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast CD, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a CD catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.